Okay, tonight they asked me to speak for 10 or 15 minutes all about patents and gear you up for what's to come later. Uh, they said, can you teach them about patents if they don't know about them in 10 or 15 minutes? And I said, sure, no problem. So uh, grab your Red Bulls, take a swig, because we're going to go pretty fast. Now, why are we all here tonight? Uh, well, part of the reason is, well, it's not an existential question or spiritual question. We're here tonight in part because of Article One, Section 8, Thomas Jefferson's baby in the Constitution, which says that Congress has the right to promulgate laws that can reward inventors for a limited time for their inventions. Now, um, we're going to start unpacking that and explaining what that means. But before we do that, I wanted to show you something very important. I used to be in-house at DuPont in their petrochemicals and engineering division. And what I learned there was to reverse engineer products and services. This chart shows you some of the intellectual property rights that apply to your creations if you're developers. So at the top level, we have trademark, trade dress, copyright, design patent, potentially rights of publicity. In the software space, we have utility patents, copyrights, and trade secrets. The equipment you're using, usually utility patents, trade secrets, sometimes design patent. Uh, in the actual content, and if you know how Nike Plus works and how it syncs up with the chip in your shoe, uh, you've got copyright on code, utility patent, trademark, trade dress, rights of publicity, and trade secret. And are there, in fact, copyright and trademark trolls? Yes, indeed, there are. They're not as prevalent as patent trolls, but they're there. So, Stay tuned, as we go forward with our organization here, we'll also unpack some of these rights as well. But know that in your development space, you are both a magnet for intellectual property claims and a dynamo for generating these types of intellectual properties. So there's more than one. Tonight we're gonna to talk about patents. Um, okay, so why do we have this concept? Well, frankly, the earliest patent system I've been able to find goes back 500 years before Christ. It was a small Greek colony, uh, the southern tip of the Italian peninsula. And what they did there is they said that if you were an inventor and you disclosed your invention for one year, you would get to enjoy the profits from your invention. Uh, that is the direct ancestor of Article I, Section 8 that I told you about. Now, there's something very important to notice there. The Greeks were very wise. When they talk about profits, they mean somebody's got to practice that invention. Right. If you look at Article 1, Section 8, is there anything in there that says you actually have to practice your invention? Let's talk about that. Um, in any case, um, it doesn't necessarily contemplate that you have to practice. Your patent gives you the right to exclude others from certain activities. It does not even give you the right to practice your invention. And as we go through the slides, I'll tell you why that's true. In any case, well, the Supreme Court gets this, um, the patent statute, which is Title 35, and they seem to think that what this is for, at least in this 1974 case, is that it helps drive employment, it helps incentivize inventors, it betters society by making better products and services accessible to us. You see, it's not just about the inventor, it's about the public too what well, we get out of the deal by giving the inventor a period of exclusive right. Unfortunately, the court has wandered away from that, thinking that it's kind of drifted away from what is the public, what is the social benefit of some of this system. Ooh. There we go. Okay, so here's, let me. There you go. Okay. Pull it behind the chair. There we go. All right. I'm okay, I'm okay, uh, trust me. Uh, here we have, so what's going on here? Patents are like contracts whereby we say to an inventor, if you disclose your invention in enough detail and with enough specificity that the public can learn from it, that they can enjoy the teachings of the patent once it's published, they can actually pra practice it once it's, once it's expired. And um, the, in return for that, the public will give you a financial incentive, they'll let you have this right of exclusion. Now, does this always work? No. Back in 1983, I started a publication called Computer Law Reporter, and one of my great honors in that enterprise was to interview Herman Goldstein from the uh, ENIAC project. And I asked him, did patents ever occur to you guys? You know, von Neumann, and the, did you guys ever think about IP? He says, no, we were just trying to create a product that worked that had a social benefit. Nobody ever thought that. You know, there was going to be an Apple and there was going to be a Microsoft and all that coming after us. We had no idea. But so anyway, sometimes this theory breaks down, when, you know, and why inventors invent, I'm not really sure. It's mostly for money. Okay. So what happens? Uh, because you can practice, a, you can have a patent, but don't have to practice it, uh, a technique developed early on called cluster patenting. And what that means is a company will grab a bunch of patents for its main product, 
which I don't know if you can see that. But then they'll also get patents in that area to build a wall to protect their market exclusivity. Now, um, in the 80s when I was uh, at the International Trade Commission as an investigative attorney, we saw this explode. That there are certain companies that have thousands of patent applications per year. I was tasked when I was doing searches in the patent office to look at the state of the art and actually um, the, this type of technology for postage machines and I had to tell the potential market entrant, Pitney Bowes has over 4,000 patents in that space. Are they practicing all of them? Probably not. But if you come into that space, you're going to step on one of them and you'll be in trouble. So you see, we, some people use patents to build walls around markets by not practicing them. Steve Fox, Deputy General Counsel of HP, says, yeah, we do that all the time. And the reason we do that is not only to protect our market, but we know there are a lot of dynamic developers out there who are going to beat us to the punch on innovation. And we want to have some chips to bargain with them. In other words, we'll sue you, or, well, maybe we won't if you give us a license under your new technology. So you have these companies building these portfolio patents, not necessarily to practice them, but to gain market leverage. Now, that may be at one level objectionable to you. What really gets objectionable is the next guy. The next guy is the non-practicing entity, the patent assertion entity, who produces nothing. So we're not really talking about necessarily cluster patenting to protect a particular product or service. What we're talking about is somebody whose product is the patent, is the intellectual property. Now, the problem with this, now, not all patent assertion entities are evil, okay? And you can look to other areas of uh, intellectual property like ASCAP and BMI where they aggregate rights to make it easier to do business. However, ultimate power corrupts ultimately, and we see developing from this type of business model a ton of abusive practices that we're going to unpack tonight and talk about. So we have people like the Electronic um, Frontier Foundation who are filing a lot of briefs and doing a lot of really good work who are really targeting these trolls, these people who don't produce anything and who use pat patent portfolios as leverage to kind of push you down. Believe me, I've seen this, I've litigated these cases. Somebody walks into your office with 40 patents that, you know, that, that about that high as a pile and says to you, you're in there somewhere. Uh, that's a very scary proposition because by the time you spend the months and months to figure out what those patents mean and spend the hundreds of thousands of dollars, you probably lost half of your business anyway. So in any case, that's what we're doing with EFF, trying to fight those abusive tactics. But then we have on the other side, we have lawyers who say, you know, patent trolls just are ways of more efficiently monetizing patent portfolios. Uh, that quite frankly, is a very Pollyanna view of the world because I've been in negotiations with patent trolls where they show up with those 30 to 40 to 50 to 1,000 patents and tell you you're in there somewhere, you figure it out, well, why don't you just pay a royalty? And their trick is to find your margin, to find out how much pain you can, you can you know, endure before you'll actually fight back. So they find your margin, they find that magic soft spot percentage, they tax you on that, you pay the royalty, and then you pass it on to your customers. So they're also aware of your market, how much you can raise your price and still maintain you know, competition, a competitive spot. So that's how this equation works, to get you to pay, even though maybe their patents aren't worth the paper they're written on. Okay, so uh, let's take a look at these non-practicing entities, these patent assertion entities. In 2002, 5% of the patent litigation was attributable to them. Take a look at this rise. 22%, 2007, 2011, 40. 2012, about 61% of the patent cases filed were practiced by these patent assertion entities, people who don't produce anything, people who don't actually uh, have any interest in negotiating with you because they don't really, uh, they don't produce anything. You can't cross-license them. You can't threaten to put them out of business. They're, they're not as vulnerable as somebody who cluster patents, for example. Now, this comes from EFF. Um, and they show you kind of the tsunami effect of this type of, uh, this type of development. But it's not just EFF. This was filed by Google, BlackBerry, Earthlink, and Red Hat April 5th before the Federal Trade Commission and the DOJ, and they used the same figures. They said, this is getting out of control. You've got these non-practicing entities with unfair leverage tactics, and they're filing over 60% of the patent lawsuits in the country. Is this really a burden on our industry? Is this really a burden? Has the patent system gone on its head and actually started stifling innovation rather than rewarding it. And when you've got somebody like Google and BlackBerry and Earthlink, not just EFF, submitting to the Department of Justice and FTC these types of, uh, these types of assertions, it's very important. Now, I've got five whole minutes left, so we are going to 
Here's a Lotus patent. If you've never seen a patent before, be grateful. But I've seen a couple of them, and this is how they work. You'll have a disclosure, an abstract, which tells you what the invention uh, generally relates to. You'll have a very thick disclosure, usually. This is actually that patent. This is the Lotus patent, that first page I have flipped up on the wall there. If you read it, and I don't really invite you to because it's very painful, uh, it reads more like a venture capital solicitation than a real disclosure of an invention. But in any case, here's their claim. And whenever you read a patent, the patent claim is the most important part because that tells you what the inventor is claiming is his or hers. Now, they're supposed to be clear, they're supposed to be concise, and they're supposed to inform us what the meets and bounds of the invention are. So, again, the theory is that um, the patent office is going to administer our statute properly, and sometimes we end up with things like this. This is a patent that issued out of the patent office. This is no joke. If you look at claim one and read it, it reads on a stick. It is a, for a dog toy that you can throw and have the dog bring it back to you as part of a game. All right, so here we have a patent on a stick. So for all this language about how the patent office really examines these things. Now imagine, take this kind of patent, take this kind of massive error and then apply it when the patent office is dealing with something this complex. How many times do you think they're going to get this wrong? Okay, if they get something like that wrong. Now, here's another patent I'm particularly fond of. This is a, if any of you guys ever want to walk a snake, you're going to have to pay a little royalty here. Um, okay, um, when I was a kid I used to hunt snakes in New Jersey where I'm from. We used to uh, hunt copperheads. We, we used the technique very much like that. So I can, I can actually invalidate this patent with the prior art. By the way, I don't recommend that as a hobby. And if you ever do, you have to know they travel in pairs. Okay, just so be very careful. Okay, so um, our patents go on any new and useful utility patents. That, by the way, we didn't talk about design patents. That's the next seminar. Uh, any new and useful machine, process, manufacture, or improvement. Um, what we're not supposed to cover are laws of nature, such as Newton's laws of gravity, or E equals MC square. Uh, so uh, our friend Einstein couldn't get a patent on his E equals MC square. But if you embodied it in a useful device, let's say an explosive device held by a North Korean dictator, well, that is an invention that actually accomplishes some sort of effect. All right, so physical phenomena such as plants and minerals that were unknown before, and abstract ideas. This is where the software patents get hairy. This is where we see a lot of pros that looks an awful like, like they're claiming math, as we heard, or simple algorithms, or hedging funds. Um, now, I'm going to skip forward because I'm getting this get off the darn stage look. Uh, what does a patent give us? It gives us the right to exclude others from making, using, offering for sale, selling the invention, or importing it into the United States. Okay, so that's the series of rights you're going to get if you get a patent. You get a right to exclude other people. Does that give you the right to practice your invention? No, because there may be somebody dominating you. So if John has a patent on a bucket, and I take his bucket and I add a handle to it, and I, add, I get a patent on a, a bucket handle combination, can I, pat, can I practice my invention? No, because I would be infringing John's patent by practicing my own invention. Could he put a, a handle on his bucket? No, he'd be infringing mine, and that's where the cross-licensing comes in. That's what our friend Steve Fox from Hewlett Packard was talking about. That's why they get so many patents, because they want to do this cross-licensing. Now, last thing. Um, What happens when you're, uh, when you're found to have violated a patent or infringed it? Uh, you can be enjoined, that means they can stop you from your infringing use. Um, in they, so you can get an injunction. If you're at the International Trade Commission, where I used to practice as an investigative attorney, your product can be excluded from the United States, or you could be ordered to cease your activities with regard to that imported product. Microsoft just had a problem in that respect. Uh, there's damages. The patentee is uh, able to get his lost profits or her lost profits or what would approximate that, or at least a reasonable license. And if it turns out that you've, you've kind of ignored the law and infringed willfully, you can be held liable for treble damages, three times the amount. Now, uh, if, if someone has acted sort of willfully in the course of this, maybe attorney's fees can be awarded as well. Now, uh, so what's going on here? We've got all these non-asserting entities using the patent system. Um, What's really at the root of the problem? Uh, a couple things. First of all, our judiciary is not particularly well educated as to the effect of their decisions. 
so when they hold a bad patent infringed or refuse to hold a patent that was uh, procured by inequitable conduct, unenforceable, what they don't seem to realize is they're impacting our jobs, they're impacting our industries, they're impacting our developers. Unfortunately, these judges sit in their rooms, most of them, not all of them, so we really need to file our briefs and educate them that when they make these decisions, uh, and I'll tell you a story very quickly, um, that impact the patent world, they have real effect. I had a patent case where my client was faced with eight patents asserted against them. I was able to show that the patent, main patent, was achieved by the inventor by not disclosing prior art that was almost exactly what he claimed as his invention. And not only did that prior art constitute his invention, it showed you how best to practice the invention, which the inventor also suppressed and didn't tell the patent office about it. So I went up to the Federal Circuit and I had the entire portfolio wiped out, but there was one judge who dissented and he said, it's a shame that people like me uh, accuse inventors of bad action in these kind of cases. You know, so I had two out of three on one, but there was still one judge who just didn't get it. That these patents, all eight of them, infected an industry for over three years and cost us millions and millions of dollars needlessly. So in any case, we've got to educate the judiciary. Pleading reform, when someone accuses you of patents, of uh, patent infringement, I'd like to see them be particular. Um, he's going to shut me down. Uh, and a comment to your agencies, right now the Federal, uh, the Federal Trade Commission and DOJ are actually looking into this problem, trying to help you. If you do have an extra 30 minutes, get online and comment. Um, and frankly, uh, what do you do when you're faced with the trolls? claim. Uh, unfortunately, in most instances, you have to take it seriously and uh, see if you can get an opinion from a competent attorney as do you practice the invention? Is the patent valid? What can you do about it? And what we're working towards in our organization is getting those services for you as cheaply or perhaps even pro bono if we can. And if you're in the development space, develop your own intellectual property so at least you may have something to threaten back with if, uh, if you are indeed sued for, for patent infringement. Sorry guys, it was fast, but thank you for your attention.